Thank you. Thank you, worship team. I lost my voice singing along with them. That was amazing. Uh, well, I'm Adam McMahon. Hi, fellowship. It's good to see a lot of friends here and um, family. And I get to serve on the teaching team. I'm one of the pastors here. So I get to do something that I love to get to do, which is preach semi-regularly. And this week, we're continuing in our series. We're going through the book of Micah, which we've cleverly titled, Who is Like God? Because Micah's name means who is like God. Uh, and, and what we've seen is that as we've gotten into the book, that the answer is no one. No one is like God, not the pagan gods that surround in the culture, not the greedy leaders of Israel, and ultimately even Micah. Although his characteristic is, is a lot more like God, even he isn't like God either. So this week, as we dig into the fourth in our sermon series, uh, we'll get to this, this fact just reiterated to us and as Lauren read in incredibly graphic detail. Uh, but first, let me ask you guys, are there any Star Wars fans in here? Any, any, will you raise your hand? Me too. I am too. Thank you. I got a few hands raised. Yeah, I am a Star Wars fan too. And I know Star Wars is kind of weird. There's some weird kind of new agey stuff in there, but I just really enjoy the whole Star Wars universe. I, I've seen all of the movies, which isn't saying a lot, but I, I've also watched most of the animated series. And I know I've even read a couple of the books and there's a hundreds of them, so just a couple's not that bad, right? My wife, meanwhile, she hasn't even seen any of the movies. It's a point of contention, but we're, getting, we're working through it. Uh, we're going to work through it. Uh, but one of the major themes in Star Wars is, is the use of power. Uh, you have these people who have powers from the Force. Now, I know if you're a really big fan, you know that's not technically true, uh, but it's not technically correct, but I don't want to spend the whole time talking about this whole sermon, just talking about Star Wars. So please deal with my oversimplification. I know I'll get letters later. Uh, but one of the more interesting subplots of the first six movies, and honestly through a lot of, of the entire series, is this one character. His name's Palpatine. You see, he has these seemingly like almost godlike powers, uh, but he hides them. But what's interesting about him is that he absolutely idolizes power. I mean, it is his, his core. He does whatever it takes to get more power. He manipulates people, politics, friendships in order just to get more power. I mean, he starts wars that kill millions of people in order to become the top guy. And then get this, after all his work and manipulation, he eventually gets this unlimited power that he's been seeking after for so long. He becomes the emperor of the galaxy, which that's, that's an impressive title. I'm impressed, but that doesn't stop him. In fact, he only gets worse. As emperor, he creates this huge thing. It's called the Death Star. Maybe you've heard of it. And uh, he destroys planets. Whole nother level. But what's fascinating about him is that throughout the films, you can actually see how this power that he's gaining and he's getting and he's seeking after so hard, how it twists his face. And it makes him this grotesque shell of a person. He goes from this normal looking guy, see, semi, semi normal, uh, to this guy. That's a change. He goes from that to this. And at the end of the original trilogy, he says these famous words that maybe you've heard. He should, after this whole time, he says, power, unlimited power. He's excited, which is such a goofy thing to say uh, that the internet turned it into a meme. And I thought I'd share a couple of my favorite ones with you. So here you go. When your phone's charged to 100%, power, <laughs> you have unlimited power. Uh, this one's great. Employees, you have no power here. Yes. Anyone ever had a boss like that? Anyone? Not me. Not my current one. I know that. <laughs> Definitely not. Not today. Not today. Okay. Uh, my favorite one, though, is this. Unlimited power. You get it? It's plugged back into it's unlimited. That's not really how that works, though. Uh, I mean, it's funny. I love memes, so it's funny to me. But it really shows how much he idolizes power that at the end of the film, right before he starts to scream about this unlimited power. And you see this throughout what he did through his entire life. And then his face, which is grotesque at this point, it really shows how he makes an idol out of power and what the results of that are. Uh, 
Uh, now, there's few of us that will ever go to that extreme for power. I mean, that's pretty much reserved for the Stalins, the Hitlers, the, the Genghis Khans of the world. But that doesn't mean that we don't also idolize power. So while we don't murder in order to get power, I hope, idolatry of power can come in less obvious ways. And we see people that idolize power all around us. Uh, the business leader whose name uh, we know better than the company that he works for, uh, who can't get out of the spotlight, who tweets all the time about not the business, but himself, not naming names, uh, your coworker that takes all the credit for something that you worked on together. And all of a sudden it became all about him. The abusive husband or father who uses his power to control his wife or his family. The mean girls in high school uh, who manipulate and control to keep their position of status. The schoolyard bully who uses his size and power to intimidate and, and push others around. And hey, you might even idolize power without even realizing it. You see, you idolize power if your sense of worth stems from your power and your recognition. If you feel like a failure, if you're not recognized, or if you don't have the power that you think you need, you probably idolize power. Now, idolizing power can become, it can come in a lot more subtle ways than, than we might think. For example, as a pastor, uh, people, they sometimes come to me for advice. And when I give it, if they do it and it actually works out, uh, I'll sometimes look at them and I'll say, man, that was me. I did well. I'm good. Way, way to go me. Or when I give counsel and they don't do it, I can see myself as a failure. Like I just didn't get through to them. I just can't, I can't counsel well. And you see, that's the thing, that's power idolatry. That's defining myself by how I impact others. And if I don't have that impact, I see myself as a failure. That's because I'm lifting up power too high. Now, if you think you might idolize power, I can tell you this passage is for you. If you think you have no power, this passage is for you. If you recognize you have power and you want to use it for good, this passage is for you. And we'll see what happens when you idolize power. We'll see it in God's word today. As Lauren read, we're going to be in Micah 3, the entire chapter, 1 through 12 today. And we'll see what it looks like to misuse power, what the consequences of misusing power are. But we'll also see the proper use of power. Now, if you have your physical Bible with you today, you can turn to Micah 3 now, or maybe you already have, or you can look it up on a phone or a tablet. And I'll be honest, it's easier because it's a small book in the back of the Old Testament. So if you have a phone, it'll be a lot easier to find. We'll also have the passages, passages on the screen. Uh, but first, let's look this, to the misuse of power, the results of idolizing power, the misuse of power. We'll look at the ways that the Israelite leaders, they misused their power. And, and what we'll see as we look at their misuses of power is what the results are of idolizing that. So when you idolize power, these are the sorts of things that happen. First, let's look at what the judges did, what the judicial leaders of their day did. The judges, they used the poor to make themselves more powerful. They're using the poor to make themselves more powerful. Look at verse one, and uh, Micah says, and I said, hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. That's the leaders. He's talking to the leaders now. Is it not for you to know justice? You see, the judges, the judicial leaders, they should know justice. Uh, but now look at what they did instead. Verse 2, you who hate the good and love the evil. Okay, so he's got that. But now he gets incredibly graphic. Uh, picture this if you can. You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones into pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Okay, so the first time I read that, I thought I didn't read it right. I was like, that can't, that really, what? That can't be saying what I think it's saying. I mean, it's shocking and it's gross. And he's saying it about the leaders of God's people. And, and here's the picture, and if you have kids in here, you might want to cover their ears for this. It's incredibly graphic. You see, the leaders, they're skinning people alive and eating them. But wait, they go even further. They pulverize their bones, and they make a stew from the marrow. You see, these powerful people, they're utterly destroying the people that they lead. Now, I can tell you all the research I read said that wasn't literally what the, lead, the leaders did. It's most likely hyperbole. 
But the researchers weren't alive then, so who knows? It's possible. But here's the point, Micah, he's making. And to understand the point, you've got to know a little bit about the world power at the time, the Assyrian, Assyrian Empire, the Assyrians. What they would do is they'd make a practice of capturing their enemies. And when they captured their enemies, they would flay their skin, which means they would peel off their skin while they were still alive. Now, why would they do that? In order to terrorize them, to subdue their enemies so that they, they wouldn't rise up against them. And you see, Micah is saying, he's saying, you're doing to your own people, to God's people, what the enemy does. But get this, he does, what he says is not only do you do that, but you go farther, you go worse. You're eating them. You're utterly destroying them. I mean, this is a terrible, and it's a graphic word picture. But you see what they did? They did this in order to feed themselves, in order to make themselves more powerful. They would destroy the people that they led. And then Micah, he comes back to them in verse nine and he says, hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. I mean, what he's saying here is that Zion, Jerusalem, the city of peace, of shalom was built by killing people. That could mean that they worked people so hard to build the city that they killed over from exhaustion. Or maybe the leaders literally murdered people in order to build the city. We're not sure. But either way, it's a terrible misuse of their power as leaders. And so we see the judges mis misuse their power by cannibalizing the people. They use the poor to make themselves more powerful. They idolized power so much that they were willing to do terrible things to become more powerful. Now let's look at the next group of leaders, the prophets. And we see what the prophets do. They sell their prophecies. The prophets, those who spoke for God to the people, they would sell their prophecies. Verse five, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who led, lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. You see the prophets, they had a lot of power as God's spokesman to the people. But the prophets, they only declare peace when someone bribes them and they curse those who can't pay them. The people who can't pay them, that's the poor, the marginalized of their society. And, but they bless the rich and the powerful who had the money and the influence. I can tell you that's not what they were called to do with the power that God gave them. When I was in seminary, I was living in Dallas and I worked for this upscale chain restaurant and I won't name it to protect your feelings about it because I'm sure you love it. Everyone does. And after I worked there for about a month, we got this new manager for the restaurant. And I can tell you, this guy, he was just, he wasn't great. He didn't seem to know how to base, do basic things that, like scheduling or communicating with the employees. And then we found out he was actually being really devious. You see, he was misusing the power he had over scheduling because he was the guy who did the scheduling to make himself look better. So what he did is he would, he would make, make it look like all the employees worked less hours, like we had vacation hours or whatever than what we really did. So that would cut down on his overhead and that, may our, our, that would make our restaurant look like it was more profitable than it really was. And it would make corporate think, wow, this guy's doing an incredible job. He's under, this, turning this underperforming restaurant around and making it profitable. You see, what I think he was doing is he was idolizing power and he wanted to work his way up in the organization and he didn't care who he hurt on the way up. So if you know someone, if you want to know if someone idolizes power, one way to tell is to look at what, what he does when he has power. Look at what that person does when they have power. If he's using that power against others for his own selfish gain, there's an idol there. That's what Micah is calling out against, the powerful people using their power against others. But there's, their time's coming. There's going to be a downfall for them. And so let's see this, the downfall of misusing power, the consequences of idolizing power. We see there's a downfall. He's coming for these leaders. There's consequences for idolizing power. And Micah, he's spelling it out for the leaders. He's telling them right now to the judges, God won't listen. Look at verse four. Then they, speaking to the judges, will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time. 
because they have made their deeds evil. You see, at some point in the future, the judges are going to cry out to God when they want him, when they need him, when they're in trouble. And at that time, God will no longer listen to them. Micah is saying, you didn't listen to the people crying for help when you killed them. And now God will no longer listen to you in your time of need. And that's not a place that you want to be in. That's not a place that anyone wants to be in. But because of how the judges misused their power, God won't listen to them. But then what does God have to say to the prophets? To the prophets, he says, God won't speak. Now remember the prophets, they spoke for God and, and God would speak to them and, he, and they're selling their prophecies. But then let's look at six and seven. Therefore, it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips for there is no answer from God. You see, these are the ones who heard from God and spoke his word to everyone else. To those, God is no longer going to speak to them. They, God would speak to them through visions and God is closing their eyes, closing their ears so they can no longer hear from him. Their visions will be no more. In fact, the imagery here is of pitch blackness. It's of an incredibly dark night for these prophets. These who are used to hearing from God, who are used to having this incredible power because God would speak to them, it's all gone. So the prophets who are used to hearing from him, their downfall is they're shut off. God's not speaking to them. But Micah, he continues this list of consequences with an incredible escalation when he speaks to all the leaders in verse, uh, verse 11, he says to all the leaders, God will destroy your entire capital city. God will destroy your entire capital city. Look at verse 11. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and they say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. So he calls out the three groups of powerful people here, the judges, the prophets, and now he adds in the priests. And all three of them are using their power to get money. Yet in the midst of these atrocious actions, they have the gall, they have the pride to say, nothing's going to happen to us. God is with us. There's no way anything bad could happen. But Micah's saying the result of idolizing and misusing your power, disaster that you said wouldn't happen, it's coming. And it's going to be worse than you ever thought possible. Zion, Jerusalem, it's going to be plowed like a field. It's going to become a pile of ruins. That's an image of utter destruction. It's like Hiroshima after the A-bomb was dropped. That kind of destruction. Jerusalem's going to be wiped clean off the map. But it gets worse. And I had to look this up to even figure out what it meant when he, when he writes, the mountain of the house of wooded height. I mean, what in the world does that even mean? And I found out he's talking about the temple and the temple mount. But he's purposely not calling it the temple. You see, it's not the temple anymore because it, God ceased to dwell there. God's presence has left the temple. And where it was simply becomes a hill full of trees. Those are dark days. This is a dark warning that Micah gives to them. I mean, honestly, there's no real comparison I can even make to you that would give you a real sense of just how terrible this prophecy would be. So I'll try anyway. It would be like someone who really knew what was going to happen. And they come in as we're all hanging out in here and they come in our doors and they tell us Longview is going to burn to the ground, the whole city your entire town, your homes, your parks, your church buildings, your community centers, your government, all burned to the ground, ashes. But not only that, Washington, D.C., our center of ca our capital city, wiped out. It's going to be leveled. And then get this, he says to us, it's your fault. 
This is all your fault. All this destruction, all this life lost because of you. I can tell you, even that wouldn't compare because we would still have God with us because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But if you take that emotion that you would feel if someone came in here and blamed for us for all that would be about to happen, but get this, we knew he was right. We knew that it was our fault. I mean, think about how crushed you'd be, how terrible you'd feel, how utterly destroyed you'd be, and you'd have some sense of how they must have felt to hear Micah say these words. To these people who idolized power above everything else, above even God, to these powerful people who worshiped power above anything else, to say all of your power is going to be gone, that would be utterly destructive. But that's what idolizing power leads you to. It leads to your downfall. Trusting in power will fail you. So I have to say, you know, people don't always get what's coming to them in, in this life. We don't always get to see justice, but sometimes we do. And that boss I had in Dallas who was stealing from his employees to move up the corporate ladder, well, we, the employees, we caught wind of what he was doing because it was on our pay stubs. Yes, he wasn't the brightest bulb in the box. He was, anyway. Uh, a bunch of us, we got together and we met with the corporate headquarters people, which happened to be just down the road from where our restaurant was, which is you think he would have thought more about this. Uh, and we informed them of what was going on, what the manager was doing. And he was promptly fired for what he did. You see, idolizing power led to his downfall. Of course, the awkward thing about this whole mess was he ended up getting a job at the store right next to us. And he would come in semi-regularly. And so we would have these awkward looks. Anyway, it was really awkward. Uh, and so what we've seen here is we've seen the consequences of idolizing power. It's your downfall. To all of the powerful people, God will destroy the center of their power. But I have to ask this question, has God abandoned them? Has he abandoned them? And I tell you, no. You see, God sent Micah to tell them what we have recorded here. I mean, that's a pretty amazing act of grace by God. He was under no compulsion to do this. And yet he willingly chose. And what Micah did is he warned them of what was coming. And in Micah 3.8, we see the proper use of power, seeking the flourishing of others. You see, the proper use of power is seeking the flourishing of others. And I, I, this is fascinating to me. You see, there is a good use of power, using it for the good of others, for the empowering of others. Look at verse eight with me. In verse eight, Micah is saying, but ask for me. And Micah, he, he's contrasting himself with these other prophets. And so Micah is saying, but ask for me, I am filled with, and there's that word, power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. You see, Micah, he's filled with power through the power of the Holy Spirit. But why? Why is Micah filled with power? And the text says to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah, he's calling out their sin, but not to crush them or to intimidate them, but so, so that they would repent. He wants them to know so that they would repent. And then this is an incredibly loving thing that God called Micah to do. And he gave him incredible power to do it. You see, when most people, they think about power, when I ask people about power, if they don't come up with Emperor Palpatine's quote, which a lot of people do, shows something about how famous those uh, stories are, they come up with this other famous quote from Lord Acton, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. But do you see the problem with this quote? You see, for, for one, God is the one with absolute power and there is no corruption in him. And then our power as Christians, it comes from the Holy Spirit and there is no corruption in the Holy Spirit because he is God. Okay. And then last, we all have some sort of power. There is no one in here who doesn't have some amount of power over someone else or in some dynamic. I mean, look at your family, right? Everyone in your family has some amount of power from the oldest to the youngest. Kids have a sort of power in their family. I was talking to Caleb, he's my oldest, he's seven about this last week. And I asked him, who do you have power over? 
he says, I think Cohen, he's our youngest. And, and you know what? He's probably right. He does have some power over Cohen. But kids also have power over their parents. I think I got an amen on that. <laughs> yes, you are right. They do. I mean, your life is utterly changed as soon as you have kids. Completely and totally. If you don't believe kids have power, watch what happens when a newborn starts to cry. See what happens to those parents. It doesn't matter if you're dead asleep, they wake up. And there is very few other people that if they call me, I'm going to wake up for. But if my kid calls or wakes me up, he's gonna, I will be awake and help him. It's amazing the amount of power they have. And there's power dynamics that happen at work, that happen amongst your friends, all over the place. In fact, I would venture to say that most of us in here, we have far more power than we realize we do. God has given us all a measure of power, of influence. And as Christians, we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwelling within us as we have the power of the Holy Spirit. That is an incredible amount of power. You see, the question isn't whether you have power or not, but rather what do you do with the power God has given you? What do you do with your God-given power? Do you use it to seek the good of others, to empower others? Do you use the power God has given you to seek the flourishing of our community? Or do you use your power for your own selfish means? Do you use your power to get more power? Pastor Todd is one of the greatest examples of using his God-given power for good I have ever known. Back before he was the lead pastor, he was the executive pastor, and I was fresh out of seminary. And what he did was amazing. You see, he would give away things that he loved doing and had been doing for years with excellence that people loved that he did. And he would do that to give me experience. He gave away the Christmas Eve service and just said, hey, take it. You're in charge of it now. He gave away the sunrise service. He gave away other things as well. And not just for me, he would give away these services to, to other junior staff too. You see, no one told him he had to do that. The elders weren't like breathing down his neck saying, you have to give these things away. But he used the power that he had to empower me and others on our staff. I mean, that's one of the reasons he's one of the greatest bosses I have ever had. And if you want to see how to use power that you have for good, talk to Todd sometime, connect with him. He's a phenomenal example of this. And I'm not just doing that because I want to raise or something. <laughs> he really is good at this. So if you idolize power though, I'm going to encourage you right now, today, repent of that idol. And you can know if you idolize power by how you use the power that you do have. You see, if your idol is power, you'll misuse the power that you have. You'll use your power for your own selfish gain. You'll use your power to try to get more power. You'll try to befriend those who you see as having more power than you. So you can kind of saddle up to them and become friends with them. You'll ignore the poor, the marginalized, those you think have less power than you. You'll use people. You'll manipulate people into giving you more power or more authority. But if you don't idolize power, you'll use the power you have for the common good to empower those around you, to help out with the poor and the marginalized. You'll sacrifice what you have for others. But I have to tell you, as we seek to repent of our idolatry, we don't merely focus away from the idols. We must focus our hearts on something, on someone else. You see, we have to look beyond Micah. We must look to the greatest prophet, to Jesus. We look to Jesus who wasn't like God, who was in fact God. You see, Jesus is the true and better Micah, who although he had all the power in the universe, chose to use his unlimited power to serve others, who built Zion and Jerusalem with blood, his own who let himself be plowed as a field on the cross when he could have easily gotten down, who took the judgment of God for the sins of not only Israel's leaders, but our sins too, who on the cross didn't lose his power, but chose to use it to love the whole world through his death, 
Fall in love with the one who did that for you. And let your love for him transform your idol of power into using it for good. Love is the one thing more powerful than power. Recognize his love for you. And so we've seen what happens when you idolize power. For the powerful people in Micah's day, they lost their power. But you can use power without idolizing it. You can use your God-given power for the good of others. Micah did this. He sought the flourishing of God's people. He spoke the truth that they needed to hear. You see, the point of the sermon is this. The point, idolizing power leads to your downfall. But positively using power leads to others flourishing. Idolizing power leads to your downfall, but positively using power leads to others flourishing. Idolizing power will lead to you misuse misusing power with the ultimate consequence of your downfall. But you can transform power and through love, use your God-given power to serve others for the good of others, to empower others, to seek the flourishing of others. So on your handout, on the online notes and on the bulletin and on the connection card, you'll see a few steps to take to respond to Micah today. And I wanna encourage you to do these. First, determine if you have a power idol. I have some questions that are in your notes that might help you identify whether you idolize power. They're both online and in the sermon handout. And uh, you can go through those, but they're questions like this. Do you define yourself by how you impact those around you? Is your greatest fear being humiliated? Do you struggle with anger when someone disrespects you? Do you hate it when someone takes credit for your work? Do the people around you at work or home or school, do they feel used? Go through those questions this week and be honest with yourself about the answers. Find out, determine if you have a power idol. And then second, identify how you use your power. We all have God-given power where we are right now. Believers, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. But how do you use that power? Write out different ways you use your power on the handout, on your phone, in a journal, however you want to do that. But take some time and write that out. Just brainstorm different ways that you use the power God has given you. Think think through your different relationships. Go through last week and think about how you've used power maybe in different situations. And think about how you've done that. Maybe you can brainstorm with a friend, your life transformation group, your small group, anything else. Get a group of people together and y'all can do this together and think about how you could have used the power that God has given you. And then third, and finally, find opportunities to use your power for the flourishing good of others. Look for opportunities this week as you go about your week to, to use the power you have to seek the flourishing of others. Look for opportunities to empower and encourage your coworkers. Look for ways to show your kids how much you love them. Pray, pay, actually pay, pay for someone's dinner if you have that money to do that. Go and visit someone who's down on their luck and just be a presence with them. Honestly, I'll be tell, I can tell you, the possibilities and ways that God could use you in others' lives, in endless. Just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And let him show you how you can do that. So there's three ways to respond. You can check them off on the care card, put them in the boxes in the foyer and put it with your name on it. And we'll pray for you this week. I I will personally pray for you this week if you do that. Um, Those are three, I think, pretty challenging things to do. So if you're doing that, I want to be able to pray for you. And I do pray that you respond by using the Holy Spirit's power this week. Because as I look out over this room, I don't see a group of people who are listening politely, waiting eagerly to go to lunch. That's only a few of you. Just kidding. Uh, I don't see weak people unable to make a difference. What I see is a room full of the most powerful people in the world. You're much more powerful than you realize, but not because of what you have done, but because of what God has done through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, because you have the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. You have the same power, friends, that that Christ rose from the dead. 
You have that power to do God's will. We are the body of Christ. We are the church and we can do amazing things. Let's pray to that end. And as I pray, I want to ask the prayer team to come up. Uh, If you can come up after the service, come and talk and pray with us. When everyone's leaving, just walk up. We'll be around for a while after the service and we would love to get to talk with you. Now let's pray. Father God, you have all of the power in the world, in the universe. You have the power to utterly destroy us. And yet instead, Father, you chose to send your son, your only son, to die on a torture device for your enemies, to draw us near to you. And yet we confess, instead of worshiping you, we have sought at times to worship the things you've given us. You've gifted us with power to glorify you, to seek the flourishing of others. Yet instead of using power for your glory, we've tried to use it for our own. Father, we've sinned. Father, forgive us. May our heart only ever after seek you. Let us fall in love with you again. Father, to give us this week, give us insight into how we can use the power you've given us to help others instead of ourselves. Use us this week to empower others, to love others, to seek their good. It is in the name of your Son, by the power of the Spirit, that we pray. Amen. Well, let me leave you with this, church. Our omnipotent and loving God has gifted us with power. Go out this week and use that power to serve him and others. Change the world. God can and will work through you. Thank you for being here. Hey, and come up and say hi afterwards. We'll be here for just a little bit.